We're going to begin reading in verse 14 uh, this morning and read down through the end of the chapter. As I've already said that we look forward to our revival services this week. That you may wonder, well, why do we have revival? I'm not going to deal with in the, the message this morning. I don't feel led to just deal with our revival, but you may ask, well, why do we do that? Why can't we just, you know, just continue like we do every week, come on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Well, revival does something uh, that uh, is not that uh, we're unable to do other times is it saturates us with the Word of God on a daily basis. And that's the purpose of revival. And uh, I have seen it on numerous times, even recently, even this summer, I've seen how that, uh, at just that, that service after service, that day after day preaching, and how that the Lord would just chip away at hearts and uh, see lost sinners come to trust Jesus as their Savior. Not that they couldn't have any other time, but that, that uh, consistency and that repetition of hearing the Word daily. And uh, we know Satan desires to take the Word of God and steal it out of the hearts of those that need to hear it. And uh, so that it's more difficult for him to do that when, uh, when the lost sinners hear the Word of God day after day. Those of us that are saved, it keeps our hearts and our minds upon the things of God. And certainly helps us to grow and uh, to put away the things that don't need to be there and to add the things that need to be there. So I trust this week that you would uh, commit to being faithful as much as you can to the revival services. I know some of you work. You're not able to come during the day. I understand that. Uh, we have services each day and each night. And uh, so that I would encourage you to make, make uh, an effort to be here this week. Certainly pray for Brother Clay. And we look forward to a wonderful week. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3, begin reading in verse 14. Paul said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That's reading down to the end of this chapter. I would encourage you this morning to keep your Bible open. We're going to turn to several scriptures uh, as we go through and try to look at the thought that the Lord has placed on my heart this morning. Now, what I've read to you is a prayer of the Apostle Paul and... Uh, we have many of the prayers of the Apostle Paul uh, recorded uh, in the Scriptures. They're preserved for us in the Scriptures. Uh, I thought about others. You think about Moses. A lot of the prayers of Moses are preserved for us in the Scriptures. Uh, David, many of the prayers of David are preserved for us uh, in the Scriptures. And I want to remind you of this, that the Apostle Paul believed in prayer. He believed in prayer. He believed that prayer not only was commanded by God, but he believed that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I know that James made that statement. But Paul believed in that because of what he wrote to us in the Scriptures. He not only believed in prayer, but Paul taught the importance of prayer. That prayer is something that's needful for us as the people of God. And Paul also practiced prayer in his life. And as we see here, as he prayed for these people, and not only prayed for them, but he prayed for us as well. But I want you to notice the focus of Paul's prayer here in the third chapter of the book of Ephesians. That the focus of Paul's prayer was not on his physical situation. That Paul dealt with physical problems. We know he dealt with eyesight problems. Uh, he dealt with a thorn in the flesh that may have been the same. Uh, he dealt with... Uh, with beatings with trouble, and he talked about that as he wrote to the church at Corinth, all the trouble that he'd gone through in his life. There were a lot of things that Paul, no doubt, had on his mind, 
and things that most of us would have probably prayed for. No doubt he wanted to be delivered from prison. He wanted to be free. And yet that his prayers always focused on the spiritual condition of people and not necessarily the physical condition of the body. And I want you to notice something in this passage of Scripture that Paul is going to pray for inner strength, I-N-N-E-R. Paul's going to pray for inner strength for these believers through the knowledge of the love of Christ. And in verse 17, he prayed that Christ would dwell in our hearts. I'm going to say our hearts because as he writes to them, he's also writing to us. That Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith and that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Now you think about those two terms, to be rooted and grounded in love. They come from two different uh, areas in life. When you think about something being rooted, you think of the botanical world, you think of a tree, you think of a plant. And uh, when a plant or a tree has a firm root system, that that tree is stable, that tree is strong, that tree can hold up to the pressures and the strains uh, of life. And we see that very clearly here in this part of the world. I heard somebody make the statement the other day, said, you know, all the rain we've been getting, if we get a, a, a hurricane to come through here, we're going to be in trouble, aren't we? Uh, because of the fact that the soil is, is so saturated and, and the trees wouldn't have anything to, uh, to, to hold on to uh, in that wind. So he talks about here the, the trees that they're strengthened by that root system. And he, he speaks of being grounded. And the word grounded speaks of the architectural world. It speaks of a building that's built with a firm foundation that it too can stand up to the pressures and the strains and the toils uh, of, of this life. And so he said here in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you may be rooted and grounded in love. And then he goes on in verse 18, which is the verse I want to preach on this morning. He says, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, Paul makes a statement here. He says that we're rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. A lot of aspects of love. You think about love toward God, love toward one another. But I don't think Paul is necessarily speaking, he is speaking of love toward God, but I believe in the context here that he's speaking of our knowledge of God's love for us. That, that when we understand the great love that God has for us, he said it does something to us. It roots us and it grounds us. He said that we're strengthened in the inner man, in the inner man that, that we're strengthened with might, in verse 16, by his spirit in the inner man by being rooted and grounded in love. I made this statement before that I believe the greatest problem, the greatest hindrance uh, to the Lord's church today and to we as His people is that we just don't love the Lord enough. I believe there's a shortage of love, uh, our, and not His love toward us, but our love toward Him. And there's four dimensions in which that in verse 18 we find the love of Christ. It's mentioned, I want to preach about that this morning uh, for a few minutes. He said, may be able to comprehend with all saints... What is the breadth and length and the depth and the height? Four dimensions. The breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. Now what I want us to do is I want to look at those, examine the love of Christ in those four dimensions that are given to us this morning. The breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. First of all, let's look at the breadth of God's love. The, the breadth of God's love. You think about a cube, you think about the dimensions of that, that it has a breadth or a width. And that's what the word breadth, breadth here means. It means the width. Have you ever considered the width or the breadth of the love of Christ, the width or the breadth of the love of Christ. 
Now, I have never started at the Atlantic Ocean and got in my vehicle and drove to the Pacific Ocean. I was talking to a friend of mine last night at the youth scene, and he told me, I, I knew they were going on vacation. I said, how was your trip? And he told me about it. He said, I put my feet in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, he said, I turned around, and I went back to my car. <laughs> he said, it wasn't very pleasant where he was. But nevertheless, you think about that, start over there at the Atlantic Ocean and drive to the Pacific Ocean, you would make a long journey. You would cover the width of the United States. And the width of the United States is about 2,800 miles from what? I have read and I've studied. That's a vast area, is it 2,800 miles? You think about getting in your car, maybe driving eight hours a day, it would take you four days to drive the width or the breadth of this nation. This nation is a vast nation. And we know there's many different landscapes as you would go from sea to shining sea that you would pass over many different landscapes. Yeah, you would go over areas that are very populated. You would go over mountains, you would go over hills and valleys, you would go over uh, places where that, that crops are, are, are grown, very agricultural areas, just it, it, probably area, any kind of area that you could think of. But I want to remind you of something this morning, that the love of Christ is much more vast than this country, isn't it? It's much wider uh, than that. And I want to go back to the book of Acts, chapter 10, and I want to read a few verses of Scripture. I believe speaks on the vastness of the love of Christ. The vastness of the love of Christ. And I want to just go ahead and make this statement this morning that you cannot measure the love of Christ. You can't measure it. You can measure earthly things. You can put a tape to them and you can get a, a measurement whether it's in inches or whether it's in feet or, or yards or miles, whatever the case might be. But the love of Christ is immeasurable. It's greater than you could ever, than man could ever express. And I'm going to tell you this before I read these, these scriptures. When I get done this morning, I'm going to have failed in trying to describe to you the love of Christ. I'm going to fail. I'm going to have come up short. I don't have the words to describe the love of Christ. I feel like in my heart that I understand to a degree the love of Christ, but the longer I live, Brother Steve, that I'll, I'll know more than I know today about the love of Christ. But in Acts chapter 10, we read about a man, we read about two men, one by the name of Cornelius and one by the name of Peter. Cornelius was a, a, a good man. He was a respected man. He was a man who feared God. But he had not heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he prayed and he gave alms and all these things, but something was missing. And we know the account. I'm not going to go back through all this that Peter would, would go up on the housetop to, to pray about, about noontime, and the Lord would let down a sheet with all manner of four-footed beasts and, and, and creeping things, and he would tell Peter, rise, slay and eat. Peter said, no, Lord. He said, these are, I'm putting it in my words, that these are, are things that are uncommon. These are things that are unclean according to the law. And I've never once eaten these things. And three times that the Lord told Peter to do that, and and. and and, and Peter would make the statement again that, you know, not so, Lord. But then the Lord would tell Peter, he said, Peter, he said, what I've cleansed, he said, call not thou common, rise up and eat. And, and Peter was in a trance when he saw this. And it said that he wondered about that that he had seen. He, he wasn't sure, he was unclear about the vision, but he knew it meant something. As he would go down from the housetop, that he would find that there were some men that had arrived at the house where Peter was staying. And uh, he began to talk to those men, and they told him, look, that, that we've been sent here by Cornelius, and he has asked for thee to come and to preach unto, unto him, because that the Lord has given him a vision to come and to call for thee. And so Peter would go with them, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called Peter to go to that place. But I want you to go down to verse 34. Verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. And again, there's a lot that I've left out in this. But as Peter would enter into the house of Cornelius, that uh, this was something unique, something new for Peter. Peter wouldn't go into the house of a Gentile, that, that he would not eat with one who was unclean. But the Lord showed Peter something. Notice the statement in verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no 
respecter of persons. Peter had learned a lesson, hadn't he? Because that Peter was one uh, who was uh, very, I, I guess I can use this term, he was very anti-Gentile, if you just want to look at it that way. He had his thoughts and his opinions about things. At least I perceive God's no respecter of persons, but verse 35, but in every nation, the word nation here means every race, every tribe, every people, in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. What did the Lord teach Peter? He taught him this, that the breadth of the love of Christ, that it, it do, it's not contained to one particular group of people. It's not contained to just us folks here in the South. It's not just contained uh, to, uh, to Caucasian people. It's not just contained to Americans. It's not just contained to a group. But he said here that in every nation, among every race, among every creed, among every language, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. You go over to the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, a very, very familiar uh, passage of Scripture. Uh, there's a statement made here uh, that uh, speaks to the breadth of the love of Christ. Romans chapter 10, in verse 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10 and verse 12, we know... The, the verses right around it, very familiar verses concerning how a person is saved, to believe in the heart and to confess with the mouth. But he says in verse 12, let me read verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek or the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The first profession of faith that I ever had after I started preaching was uh, up at McGee that uh, Brother Nacho had invited a group of us to come up and have service with them. And uh, I preached that night through an interpreter through a, through, to Hispanic people. And uh, at the end of the message, I, I read these verses of Scripture that there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, that the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. And I said, you know, that we may speak a different language, we may have a different skin tone, we may have a different culture, we may be from a different place, but this gospel that I preach to you tonight is good for me and it's good for you. And that night, that uh, 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 she was a grown lady, that she came she professed her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not telling you that to say that ten roses on me. No, not at all. What I'm saying is that the Lord is rich unto all that call upon Him. No matter who a person may be, the, the, the breadth of the love of Christ, it extends to all men. You can go on over to the book of Revelation. Let me read you a verse of Scripture in Revelation chapter 5 in verse 9. This speaks of of, of the church after it's in heaven, after the rapture. It says uh, this, verse 9, They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Who's going to be in heaven? It's going to be believers from every nation of people on the face of of the earth. Everyone. We get in our minds sometimes, well, it's just us. There's just heathens. You know, the rest of the world is just a bunch of heathen people. I can't, I can't just take you to these. I've never been to these nations. I can't give you facts to back up what I'm about to say. Brother Kyle, I believe this. I believe in every nation in the world that there's believers. Everyone. That shows us the breadth of the love of Christ. Let me read you one more verse of Scripture, one that's not as familiar to us. In the book of, uh, of Isaiah, chapter 56, 
Listen to these verses, beginning in verse 3. Isaiah wrote, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house, and within my walls a place, and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer, listen to this, for all people. For all people. We probably have our prejudices and we have our thoughts and our opinions about this group and that group and another group. And I'm not going to go there this morning. I just want to remind you of this, that the breadth of the love of Christ is limitless. It's limitless. And we're no better than anybody else. But the only reason that we have that we have been blessed to come up in a in a land as we have is because of the effect of the Word of God upon this land. The love of Christ, the breadth of the love of Christ is, is measureless. Who are we that God should love us? But Jimmy Dale, who are we? We're just sorry sinners. That's all we are. That have been blessed to be affected by the love of Christ. So he said here that we may be able to comprehend, first of all, the breadth of the love of Christ. Now the second part of that Let's look at the length of the love of Christ. He said the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. Now, I know that length can be spoken of in two ways. It can be spoken of as a measure, or it can be spoken of as a span of time. I believe in the context of what Paul wrote, he's speaking here of a span of time. So let's think about the love of Christ. How long has the Lord how long has the Lord loved us? How long will he love us? In Jeremiah chapter 31, let me read you verse 3. And I'm going to give you the answer to that. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me saying, "Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness I have drawn thee." When did the Lord begin to love us? There's no answer for that. Because we just read, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. God is eternal, and the love of God is eternal. Paul wrote to Timothy, and I'm going to read, read you this verse of Scripture, in the book of 2 Timothy Chapter 1. Listen to uh, what Paul wrote concerning the uh, eternal nature of the love of Christ. He says this in verse 9, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But preacher, you know, there was a time b before, you know, God's eternal so that, you know, obviously he's, he's always been. There was a time before this, this period of time given to us here in, in verse 9. That it's, this is just a span of time before the world began that, you know, he decided to love us. I'd have to argue with you about that. He says he loved us with everlasting love. I believe this today, that the redemption plan of God, it was worked out in the beginning. In the beginning. He knew that we would need a Savior. He knew that, that man would sin and would be totally incapable 
of redeeming himself. And so that way back yonder, that plan was, was not only formulated, but it was put into place. And I want to remind you of something this morning. Brother Allen, he looked down in time and he saw you. Brother Wilfred, he looked down through time and he saw you. And he looked down through time and he saw me. And he loved us from eternity past. So you think about the length of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you can't go back to a time when he didn't love us. But let's go forward. We know he loves us now, but let's go forward. In Romans chapter 8, I'm going to read you a verse of scripture here. And I know I'm reading a lot this morning because I can't express to you the love of Christ. I've already said that. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. So he's loved us from the beginning of time. Will he continue to love us in eternity future? The question is asked in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or nakedness or peril or sword? If you go all through all those things, does that mean that God does not love you anymore? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. The answer is given to us in verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you notice that statement? He said, nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Not only has he loved us from eternity past, but he's going to continue to love us in eternity future. Because the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same when? Yesterday, today, and forever. There's nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the breadth of the love of Christ extends to all men. The length of the love of Christ is from eternity past to eternity future. Now, what about the depth of the love of Christ? I'm going to give you another word for depth here. I looked this up and uh, got settled on exactly what the meaning of the word depth is in Ephesians chapter 3. It simply means the extent or the degree to which. So what is the extent or the degree to which that the Lord loves us? There's different degrees of love. Let me use an example. Now, don't take this the wrong way. I love your children. I love my children more. Brother Brent, you're not supposed to love your... Yeah, I am. They're my children. And you're the same way. You love my children, but you love your children more. You can love more and love less. So what's the extent of the love of Christ? How much does he love us? Does he love us just a little bit? Does he love us a lot? You know, you ask your little child, how much do you love me? I love you this much, you know. Does he really love us this much? What is the extent of the love of Christ? Well, Jesus said this in John chapter 15 and verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. How can you express to someone the degree to which you love them? He said the greatest way is you lay down your life for them. So we know what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. You go back just to over a few chapters to the book of Romans chapter 5. Listen to this statement in verse 6. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure will a... For a good man, some would even dare to die. Listen to this. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What is the extent of the love of Christ? It's measureless, isn't it? You see, the length was measureless. You can't measure eternity. The breadth was measureless because it extends to all men. Now the depth of the love of Christ, the extent to which he loves us, 
is measureless. He gave his all. There's no value that you can put uh, upon that. In Philippians chapter 2, it speaks of, of the humiliation of Christ and how that he was with the Father, but he didn't hold on or didn't think that was something to be held on to, but he came to earth and he humbled himself and he humbled himself to the death, not just any death, but to the death on the cross to prove how much he loves us. And so you think about the depth of the love of Christ, the extent of the love of Christ. How much does Christ love you? He loves you all the way. He's done everything in the world for you. Listen to this verse of Scripture in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Now think about that. I'm going to read the rest of the verse in a minute. He that spared not his own son. What if I, told, what if I tell you, you know, uh, I may maybe tell Brother Tommy, Brother Tommy, I love you, I'll do anything in the world for you. Brother Tommy really doesn't know if I'll do anything in the world for him. Until I've made the ultimate sacrifice, right? And that's what it says here about, about Christ. It, it said that God spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How could he do anything greater? He can't. There's nothing greater that he can do to show you how much he loves you. And so then the question is asked, shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he's given the greatest gift, he's able to give everything else that you need. That means every situation in life, you can trust the Lord because he has already given the ultimate gift that he gave his son for our sins. So we think about the breadth of the love of Christ, limitless. The length of the love of Christ, eternity to eternity. The depth of the love of Christ, the extent of the love of Christ. He gave it all. And the last thing that Paul mentioned, he said that we'd be able to comprehend the height of the Lord Jesus Christ. The height of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word height means elevation. Brother Clay's tall, we know that. I hear some of you asking, how's the weather up there sometimes? That's pretty clever. But that's not the elevation he's talking about here. He's talking about here to, to be raised in rank or degree. To be raised in rank or degree to be elevated, to be exalted. And I'm going to read you one more verse of Scripture in 1 John chapter 3. Listen to this. Verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Did God exalt you when you were saved? He did, didn't He? He made you a son of his. But that exaltation is not completed. He said, not only should we be called the sons of God, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And then he says in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, he's not finished. Do y'all realize that the Lord still has some unfinished business? I might preach on that one day. He said, he said it's finished at Calvary. But there's still some unfinished business that the Lord has. And one of those things, he's going to give us a new body, isn't he? If you're saved. All these things are dependent upon you trusting Jesus, by the way. And that's what he says here. We are now the sons of God, but, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You see, there's something else that he still has for us. He's still going to exalt us. He's still going to elevate us to a position that's a position of honor, position of glory. He said that we're joint heirs with, with Christ, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, that we have an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled, that fadeth not away. He made the statement in the Scriptures that the saints are going to judge the angels. He said he's got a place prepared for us. Think about that. To rule and reign with him on this earth for a thousand years. And then to have that new 
city, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And it said those that would inhabit that city are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The height of the love of Christ. Think about the glorification that he has for us one day, limitless. And so the increase of his government, there's no end. So this morning, the breadth, the length, the depth, the extent, and the height of the love of Christ, it's all measureless. Now, if you're here this morning and you're lost, God has provided an opportunity for every man, woman, boy, and girl to be saved. He gave His Son the free gift of salvation. And yet God made all of us with a free will. We can accept or we can reject what He's done for us. Today the choice is yours. You can accept Jesus as your Savior, believe and trust Him, and have eternal life. And all these things will apply to you this morning. You can reject Christ. But you can lift your eyes in the devil's hell. And I'll tell you, hell is apart from the love of Christ. No love of Christ there. Nothing can separate the child of God from the love of Christ. If you fail to love the Son, if you fail to trust Him, you will be separated from the love of God. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And God will save you if you just simply believe and trust in the wonderful name of Jesus. Let's not forget the vastness of the love of Christ. And again, I failed this morning trying to bring it out, but I just want you to remind, I want to remind you there's no limit. There's no way to measure the greatness, the fullness, and the richness of the love of Christ. Let's have a song this morning. If there be anything on your heart.